also have Bridie Scott Parker back. So before we get deeper into that, let's just come back to Bridie. Uh, yes, I just wanted to know, Bridie, how much we have managed to get the road toll down over the past 20 years. Thank you, Amanda. A slight microphone hiccup, but I'm happy to <laughs> talk about road safety now. So if we think back to the 70s, we actually reached this dreadful peak in road safety and we thought, OK, what can we do to change it? And the two greatest initiatives we brought in were compulsory seatbelts and random breath testing. So since that time, we've seen great reductions generally each year across all of our states and territories and across Australia. But as you mentioned in the introduction, there's a bit of a problem now. We seem to have stalled in any of the progress we're making. And in some cases, the road toll is actually getting worse each year. Is that in uh, particular places that it's getting when you say getting worse, it's, it's going up again? It is. So if we had, what, what we like to do is compare rather than a year to another year, if we look at that five year rolling average. So if we're comparing some of our states across those five year averages, we're seeing some increases in fatalities in Tasmania, South Australia, New South Wales, and here in Queensland, although overall we're seeing some small reductions, there's sections of Queensland, such as our metropolitan areas, which have actually had an increase in crashes, while other areas have had a reduction. Okay, so that's interesting because, uh, you know, the, the one area that's always been more of a problem is uh, country roads compared to metropolitan roads and deaths. So are you saying that's shifting a little bit now? It seems to be, and it could be related to the way that we respond to crashes now. So we have this mentality of scoop up the people involved in a crash and get them into emergency treatment at a hospital or similar centre as soon as possible. If we can get someone from a crash involved vehicle into an operating room within that golden hour, that first hour after a crash, we call that the golden hour, the survivability increases greatly. Whereas sometimes in the past, we tended to spend hours at a crash site trying to stabilise victims, and they may not have had such great survival rates. And this is something you really know well in a way personally. I mean, you grew up on the, the Darling Downs with its you know, gravel roads and where you can, you know, you're driving long distances. Has that shaped your thinking? It definitely has. So we learnt to drive on some pretty, pretty sh uh, shifty roads, we would call them by today's standards. The other problem in country areas is that there tends to be rather high speed limits. So we're travelling on roads that aren't so great, colliding with other vehicles or roadside vegetation at pretty high speeds, and we mightn't actually be found for a little while after the crash. And that can reflect, unfortunately, greater death rates in the country, and particularly in the area of young drivers. Growing up in the country, the mindset at the time was excellent. The kids have been driving on the farm. They're going to be safe on the road. We don't have to worry about them. In fact, it's actually completely the opposite, Amanda. We find that, unfortunately, kids who are driving on farms or in country areas before they're legally licensed are actually more confident because they think they're really great drivers. The problem is driving on a farm isn't the same as driving on high-speed roads or through complex intersections, road work, and in heavy rain, it's quite a different environment, and we see spikes in crashes from country kids as well. Well, now, with road safety campaigns, Bridie, the, the focus has been very strongly on alcohol, the whole if you drink, don't drive focus, and also speeding and fatigue. But um, I'm wondering, you know, I want to talk about new strategies that are needed for prevention. How many road deaths are drug related, do we know that? So that's a really tricky question to answer. When we have someone who's fatally injured in a crash, it's standard operating practice to take a blood sample and test for alcohol and drugs. But of course we know that there are less serious crashes where someone isn't hurt. So if we're only touching the fatality crashes, I think we're only just scraping the surface of the problem. In Queensland in 2017, we know we had a spike in fatalities in which someone who had been drinking was involved in the crash. My philosophy and the advice that I always give is if you're planning to have a drink, don't drive. If you're sure, planning to drive, don't I'm, drink. What I'm interested in is, uh, is uh, drug influence, drug affected drivers, whether yep. that's uh, illegal illicit drugs or prescription drugs. So that's a complicated picture and you're exactly right, that's a huge road safety problem. 
We know that when we're looking at fatal crashes, we are seeing more and more each year drivers who are under the influence of illicit drugs, and they can be something that's more sedating, like marijuana, or something that's a stimulant, like cocaine. The unknown problem that we really are just beginning to scrape the surface on is legal medication that could impact on your driving. So you mightn't be well, you'll be looked after by your general practitioner, and they might prescribe a drug. And when you get to the chemist, there's a little sticker on it that says, hang on, try this medication first before you drive or operate any machinery, because it can impact the way that you make decisions, the way that you react, and or your motor control. And we really don't know the involvement of those prescription medications in crashes. Well, let's come back now to Professor Paul Haber. Uh, who as well as being clinical director of drug services for the Sydney Local Health District is head of addiction medicine at Sydney University. Paul, when GPs write prescriptions for things like antidepressants or painkillers or uh, and opioids, are they actively thinking how might this affect this patient when they're behind the wheel? I think in general GPs are and as uh, Bridie's already said, there are bright yellow stickers on the labels of prescription medications. And uh, so I think the, the concern is in general well known. What's happening though is that, as I understand it, Sydney University has just been contracted by New South Wales Health to uh, train GPs to be able to, for example, better identify patients who are on medications that might make them a danger on our roads. Now what's prompted this? Um, I think uh, Bridie's already highlighted the, the, uh, the fact that we have an increasing problem with uh, drugs and driving and in New South Wales this has been increasingly a matter of uh, public and uh, government concern. Um, yes, and there was a whole debate sparked in New South Wales uh, with a terrible crash on Boxing Day last year on the south coast of New South Wales that killed uh, four people, the actress Jessica Falcott, uh, Holt and um, family members plus the driver who was coming back from a methadone clinic? I don't know where that driver was going to and from, but uh, the rest of that uh, story is, is completely uh, true and was widely discussed at the time. Mm. But it, highlights the general concern that um, that we've been having and um, you know I think it was four or five people killed in a single crash certainly is a, is a tragic event and that we should be thinking about and should respond to and uh, so New South Wales Health had in fact just yesterday released uh, updated clinical guidelines for doctors involved in the addiction program to improve the way that uh, we prescribe these medications to people with their addiction problems. But in addition, uh, we've been given a contract to generate some training materials for doctors um, in driving safety. And although the risks are known, it does get complicated. Um, firstly, people are taking more than one medication often enough. Uh, secondly, they have other health conditions that can impact on driving and other aspects of driving safety that are un not directly related to health like uh, drowsiness and driving on unfamiliar roads and other things that make driving more difficult mm. broadly to anyone and also we have to deal with people uh, that are prob that may be taking medications that we're not prescribing uh, or that may be taking excessive doses of medicines even if we are prescribing them so does, even though the risks are at, at, at base level well known, it does get complicated. Yeah, no, I'm getting a sense of that from what you're saying. So how will this doctor training work? What will, what, what will be done in practice? Uh, well, uh, there are three elements to the training. One is for those that wish to enter the method of prescribing course. The second is for any doctor who wants at least some basic information about that uh, program, even if they're not going to do a lot of that work. And then thirdly, is it 
a specific module about medications and driving for a broad range of doctors, uh, GPs, doctors working in hospitals, particularly emergency departments, um, as well as specialists. Paul, are we potentially seeing more road deaths linked to prescription drugs because, well, more of us are living longer and taking more medications? Yes, that's, um, Bridie's already highlighted that this is not as easy to untangle as you might wish. So, for example, if we, if we find drugs in the blood of someone who's had a crash, it doesn't necessarily mean that those drugs caused the crash, of course. And if 5% of the community have a certain drug, are taking a certain drug, it stands to reason that 5% of road victims will probably have that drug in them as well just as an example so we don't so the cause and association is not always uh, straightforward yeah here in light matters we're talking about potential new strategies for getting the road toll down and let me throw the question out to you too in general what public campaigns have influenced your behavior as a driver uh, remember the kerfuffle when compulsory seat belts were introduced and remember when driving after a few too many drinks didn't seem what are your thoughts about what we can do better now to reduce the road toll? Let's know on Facebook. Otherwise, on the SMS, 0418 226 576 is the number. And Paul Haber, while it is, you know, clearly important to tackle the issue of safe prescribing in, in an attempt to reduce road, desk, road deaths, given all its complexity as you've been describing, kind of can't do that without tackling the wider social addiction problems, can you, be they prescription or illegal drugs? I think that you're right. Um, on the other hand, people do sometimes respect boundaries and can differentiate between, let's say, drinking and driving or using a medication and driving. So even if they have a problem with their substance use, they can, under, they can understand and respect the, uh, uh, the boundary that you shouldn't go out and drive a car in that state. So not everyone that has a substance use problems is a dangerous driver. Many, many people that I've encountered in my clinical practice uh, have chosen not to drive at all or are very careful about how they drive. Not, notwithstanding all of that, make a fair point that if if we have substantial problems with substance misuse through the whole community it's inevitably going to have impacts on driving as, as with other things. Well Bridie Scott Parker what role do you want to see GPs play when it comes to prescription drugs and road safety? So I think it's a great idea to have this holistic approach and think about the patient or the person that you're treating at the time what does their world look like and a key part of that world is this whole notion of getting from A to B. We have to balance mobility with safety. It's not simply just a matter of treating the medical condition, we're treating the person. And we know that crash risks can be increased, like we've talked about, through assorted uh, reasons, such as taking a new medication that perhaps might take six to eight weeks to adjust to. So if we know that potentially is a problem, what are our mobility options? Can we talk also with our patients? Can we liaise with the pharmacist as well? Who are we? So we want the patient to think about themselves. Who are they? What's happening in their situation? But then think about their mobility. When are they driving? Where are they driving? Why are they driving? And what are they driving in? And if it doesn't sound like it's gonna be a safe journey even before you head out that door, we need to have options and options include public transport. Some venues such as RSLs will collect people from their homes and then drop them back if they're going to a social gathering. It can be pretty challenging though in country areas. We have less transport options. So what I think we actually need to do is have a bit of a whole of person, whole of community approach. Crashes, whether someone's killed or not, there can be pretty serious injuries that come out of them as well. And it's the community that's impacted by them. Like you mentioned, that dreadful crash on Boxing Day, 
the whole Australian community was affected by that because so many of us loved the actress that unfortunately was killed with her family. So I think it's time to all of us work together but pull back what is happening with our person, our most important person that we are treating who is in our room at that time and let's think about ways we can keep them safe throughout their day. Yes, I mean, with, as, as you say too, with alcohol, you know, uh, we're pretty used now to nominating a, a, a designated driver, but uh, when it comes to other issues like the effects of medication, you know, we need to think of some, some other ways to do it. I just also want to talk about more generally about fatigue, mm -hmm. sobriety and driving, uh, whether that's, you know, related to uh, uh, the, the effects of a medication or not. Uh, and, uh, and it's because I know that you have a medical condition that means that you have to manage fatigue and driving very carefully. Can you tell us about that? Sure, very happy to. So I have to drive when I'm coming into my office, 58 minutes either way, and then I have quite a very busy day. I'm juggling teenage children as well, and a husband who does shift work, in amongst things, fun things like housework. I have multiple sclerosis and multiple sclerosis means that sometimes you are very fatigued and that can even change in the space of an hour and certainly within the space of a day. I know in advance that if I've had a big day, for example Monday I was in Melbourne, I planned not to drive on Tuesday. I have a big day today so I'm driving today. I need to be in my office tomorrow so I've recruited my husband on his audio to be my taxi driver for me tomorrow and my children and my husband are very happy to step up. Part of that can be because of the medication that I am also on to treat the neuropathic pain that's related to my condition. So it's really important that anyone who has a medical condition thinks to themselves is the most important thing that I get behind this wheel or do I have options? Planning ahead is definitely everyone's best friend. Well, it's very good to hear your own experience there. Dr Bridie Scott Parker is a Senior Research Fellow in Road Safety at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And Professor Paul Haber is the Clinical Director of Drug Services for the Sydney Local Health District and he's Head of Addiction Medicine at the University of Sydney Medical School. Good to talk to you both, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, both of those people are exercised finding new strategies and ways to keep reducing the road toll in Tasmania. And that's because despite years of public road safety campaigns, there were still 1,200 people who died on our roads last year. Each of those people mourned and survived those who loved them. So what are your 